Welcome to the Prime Venture Partners Podcast. I'm your host, Amit Somani, and I'm delighted to have with me Shirish Natkarni. He is a serial entrepreneur, an ex-Microsoft veteran, and now has recently published a book. So he's an author as well. Welcome to the show, Shirish. Thank you very much for having me. Shirish, you had a long and illustrious career, both as a corporate executive and then a you know multiple time founder. And now I know you also do angel investing. Can we maybe step back a little bit, say 20 years and talk about one of the most famous acquisitions perhaps in the history of the internet and one of the earliest ones perhaps as well, which was Hotmail. I, I believe you were a part of the acquiring side. So can you talk to us about what the environment was back in the late 90s at Microsoft and in the overall internet ecosystem? Yeah, you bet. So uh, at that time, this was in 1997. At that time, I was um, responsible for the product strategy for MSN.com. And Microsoft was migrating from what was a proprietary online service called MSN to a web-based portal called MSN.com. And we were missing two key elements of our strategy. One was search uh, and the second was email. So on the email front, um, we felt email was very important uh, because it's an application that you use on a daily basis and it's a very sticky application. So once you come into our web portal to access email, then hopefully you can access other services that we would provide. So that is the kind of strategic reasoning behind the interest in email specifically. And at that time, Hotmail had pioneered the notion of web-based email. In fact, they were the first SaaS service of its kind ever at that time, they were growing very rapidly. So I made the pitch internally to my management that we should go acquire Hotmail because they were adding about a million users a month. And I convinced my management and then we went up all the way to Bill Gates to convince him. But it was a real challenge because this was at the time of the dot-com boom. And uh, our CFO uh, had warned us that this would cause us uh, cost us a lot of money, you know, probably in the range of three, four hundred million dollars, because Hotmail at that time had the option of going public, and probably would have gone public at a billion dollar, you know, valuation. And so, fortunately for us, I was able to convince both Sabi Bhatia, the founder of Hotmail, as well as convince uh, Bill Gates and the email team at Microsoft that it made sense for us to go acquire Hotmail, and ultimately we paid, you know, four hundred million for that acquisition. Absolutely. I remember that both as a Hotmail user back in the day and then uh, even later on having heard Sabir Bhatia talk about it and, and so forth. How about the rest of the internet ecosystem, right? Uh, of course, Microsoft has recently become very acquisitive again. Microsoft you know, has had multiple journeys by itself. So what was this whole build versus buy thing? How did you guys think about the rest of the ecosystem? I know you were involved with MSN, but there were so many other things that were happening at that time. Yeah, I mean, there's always the build versus buy kind of um, scenario. Recently, for example, Microsoft acquired a company that I invested in called Ally. They were looking at OKRs, objectives and key results as a key element of their strategy. And I'm sure they had internally a build versus buy kind of dialogue, but they ultimately decided to go buy Ally, even though I'm sure it was a fairly expensive acquisition. Uh, But if the strategy is being driven by the business folks, as I did at Microsoft, you know, time to market many times is essential. Uh, and even though you might be able to build it, uh, buying somebody who has built the technology, who has momentum in terms of uh, customer base, et cetera, can go a long ways towards justifying an expensive you know, acquisition. In the case of Hotmail, for example, they ended up with 300 million users ultimately and was one of the top email solutions out there. So it was well justified in terms of the acquisition you know, price. So that's you know, often the discussion that goes on is build versus buy. And Microsoft now has the currency, for example, to go easily and acquire a lot of companies. Fantastic. It's a great segue into your recent uh, book that you just authored, right? From startup to exit. And love to talk about it in a reverse chronological order, right? You know, I'm a big fan of Stephen Covey used to say, begin with the end in mind. Eventually, right. the goal of any company could be an IPO, could be an MA, could be really to create large value, right, for all its stakeholders, uh, mm-hmm. employees, investors, the founders, of course, most importantly, and so forth. So, this book, From Startup to Exit, has multiple sections, but maybe we'll start with the exit first, since you mentioned Ally.io and, and Hotmail <laughs> and so forth. So, how should one, as an early stage founder, right from the early days, 
think about it and our idea is not of course i mean you want to build a you know you want to be a missionary founder and build a company for a very long amount of time but do you also believe that exits just don't happen randomly and serendipitously and have to be cultivated how should one oh, think absolutely. about it if how should one think about it uh, absolutely one of the things that <clears throat> i talk about in the book and i mention to entrepreneurs is that uh, yes yeah, certainly you should have a missionary mindset and you should build for the long term and really focus on building the business because that's the best way to get a good exit but you should also draw up a list of major players in your industry what you should be doing is reaching out you know at the right time of course reaching out to them to explore potential business partnerships or relationships where they might be distributing your solution or making part of their marketplace or training their sales force etc and even though for the first you know two or three years your relationship may be you know kind of a, a relationship where you know you're a partner etc ultimately what may happen is that acquiring company may reach the conclusion uh, because they have been successful in selling your product etc that it is strategic for them and they need to go acquire your company and it's a lot easier at that point to get an acquisition to happen because they're familiar with the business they're familiar with the kind of revenues they're able to generate and that gives them a lot more confidence to go acquire your company versus somebody else so that's one of the things that we did as as a board is keep track of potential acquirers and then explore opportunities to build relationships with them shesh i want to double click on several things here one is that you know you you might be afraid of quote unquote sleeping with the enemy right because you're like let's say you're competing as well if it's a clear segregated thing then there's no problem right like microsoft right. not doing okrs ali.io is doing okrs or at yeah. least obviously so so it's fine we can talk we can partner in other cases you feel like no we are you know partly competing partly collaborating and they will learn more about us so you'll always have that paranoia kind of thing mm-hmm. as the founder so any thoughts on number 1 that number 2 like you said in most companies and i used to be at google and and do okrs and so forth as well is that the business leaders or the product leaders typically are the big drivers of the acquisition not the cop dev folks cop dev folks right. come towards the end and help close the deal and the terms and and kind of take it through the process so maybe if you can talk about both like how do you overcome the fear of paranoia right that they will quote unquote steal our stuff or they will know how much traction we really have and that kind of stuff especially when you're on this thing and how do you make the relationships with the product business leaders uh, not just mm-hmm. cop dev yeah so on the first point my philosophy is that you don't really have to be that afraid of um, your competition especially larger you know competitors because they are slow to move and they probably already you know familiar with with what you're doing how many users you have and so forth it's better to establish a relationship you know, you may not enter into a relationship with them at that point but it's better to establish a dialogue uh, with them and even potentially explore a partnership for example when i was doing limoca which we'll hopefully talk about more in more detail which is a language learning startup we established a relationship with pearson which is a very large education company and they had their own language learning products but we were really not very concerned about them having something that could compete with limoca which was a social language learning platform and in fact we ended up with a uh, partnership with them where we decided to you know license their content and uh, build a relationship around that now they they ultimately did not acquire us but they could have certainly been an acquirer of limoca we ended up selling to rosetta stone instead but even there you know we had a conversation with rosetta stone fairly early on when we were not even talking about an acquisition the ceo reached out to me he was in town he wanted to have a chat and i said you know sure i'd uh, be happy to have a discussion you may want to keep certain things close to your chest but there's no reason why you can't have a conversation with your competitors now to your second point about cop dev versus uh, uh, the product side i'm a big believer in establishing relationships with the business leaders as opposed to cop dev because they are the ones who make the ultimate decision on whether to acquire or not so in the case of hotmail for example i was the product leader the business leader within msn and i was the one who made the evaluation of hotmail and decided that we needed to build hotmail and then once i had convinced management then i got the finance team involved in the acquisition process now that process works differently if you're hiring an investment bank 
as you know. Uh, with an investment bank, their relationships are typically with the corp dev people, and then they go through that gateway uh, to the business leaders and get you know feedback and whether an acquisition is possible. So it really depends on the situation, but I'm a big believer in reaching out to the business folks first. So let's, let's and, and Hotmail might have been different because they were rapidly growing back at the time, but let's say I'm a founder of a company and I want to make a relationship with somebody in, I don't know, Salesforce or, or something yeah. else, right? Any kind of practical tips or thoughts on, on how do you kind of do that, right? Because you're obviously not going to like randomly send a you know, LinkedIn email saying, hey, I'm <laughs> such and such, and I'd love to talk to you because you're a SVP product at Salesforce. Right. Well, there are a number of ways you can uh, do that. Certainly, uh, you want to you know, establish your, yourself on their marketplace and drive a good amount of revenue through their marketplace. They are certainly tracking your sales, right? Because uh, they can track how much you're selling through their marketplace. So they'll have a good sense for what companies are doing really well on their marketplace. The second way that you can uh, do this is through your common customers, because your common customers will demand a certain level of integration beyond what may be immediately obvious. They may want deeper integration uh, with somebody like Salesforce, and that will also create an opportunity for you to have a conversation with the product teams to say, hey, can you give us better access? Can we work closely to you know, provide better integration for our customers? And then, of course, through your board, uh, your advisors, those are some of the ways that you can get in touch with a large company. Yeah, I love the last point, and we often encourage that uh, for you know, startups we work with or, or we help, which is that you can actually leverage the investors of the other companies, right? Of course, Salesforce is too large now and you know a big public company because they are often in the know about what is happening and what are what is in some of the internal board conversations and so on. Right. So great segue into jumping, you know, since we're going reverse chronological into <laughs> your startup journey, right? Uh, from exit to startup, as opposed to your book, which is from startup to exit. You know, talk to us a little bit about Live Mocha. And mm -hmm. in, in particular, and now I know you do a lot of angel investing yourself and also advise startups. Let's start at the beginning, which is fundraising. Mm -hmm. How do you advise people to run an effective fundraising strategy at the early stage? And in particular, any tips on what are you looking as an investor or what do you know other investors they're looking for? How should one structure the investing pitch? Some of these are in your book as well. So love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, there are a couple of things that I um, emphasize in my book. One is it's really important to tell a great story. What prompted you to start your company? But more importantly, what is the global you know, trend or transformation or technology innovation that is driving your vision. What is it about that allow, is allowing your company to emerge and really disrupt existing players in the industry? So in the case of Limoca, for example, this was in 2007 when we started the company. We were in the middle of the globalization phenomena and companies were outsourcing their manufacturing jobs, their knowledge worker jobs, their IT jobs, et cetera. And you had a significant amount of demand for learning English. So I painted this picture of this globalization that was happening and that there were a billion plus people who are interested in learning English. And certainly when you talk about a billion people, which is not a you know, number out of the sky, but a real number, then people take notice and they can see along with you how big really the opportunity is. It's much bigger than any of the existing players in the market. So that's one thing I talk about, the importance of telling an overall story. The second thing that you need to do is to really coordinate your VC engagement. You want to essentially start all the VC interactions at around the same time, and you want to keep them going uh, in terms of their due diligence and all the other stuff that they need to do along at the same pace. So if somebody is ahead of somebody else, then slow them down and make the other ones go faster. Because what you want to do is you want to make sure that when you get term sheets, you're getting multiple term sheets at the same time. Otherwise, you have a situation where somebody might give you a term sheet and say, hey, you have 24 hours or one week or whatever to respond, and you don't have other term sheets on the table. So managing that workflow, uh, that whole process is very important. And the third thing I would say is time your fundraising activities when you have significant traction. Uh, because that's one of the proof points that investors look at is, uh, do you really have product market fit? 
And is there real customer demand that justifies uh, the vision that you have? So, I mean, there are many other things I can talk about in more detail, but those are some of the things I would emphasize in terms of the fundraising journey. I want to go to the storytelling one because it's one that often comes up uh, because we also invest in startups and so forth. So there are two elements I feel to storytelling. And I think you alluded to both, right? One is the journey of your startup. Like, why did you start? What was the inspiration, et cetera? And sometimes that may or may not connect with the investor because if they have not appreciated that problem, even though they may appreciate your journey. The second is painting a story of how the world will be five years from now, right? Or 10 yeah. years from now and of why this is going to be a big thing. Uh, and often when you're fundraising, there's this struggle between how much are you selling the dream versus how mm -hmm. much are you selling the metrics or the data, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Depending on the stage that you're at, right? I mean, obviously when you're yeah. just starting up, you know, a guy and a gal and dog in the garage, there's largely a dream and not much data to go around. But let's say for a right. Series A type of a thing. Uh, so any thoughts on kind of how to balance the storytelling for the future, as well as this role of metrics versus data, right? Because I might be at a million ARR, but I'm like saying, look, I'm going to be doing... $500 million in revenue in five years. And it seems very mm -hmm. like, wait, wait a second, like this seems a little far-fetched. Right. No, I don't think it's uh, really that contradictory uh, because the VCs want to invest in companies that will reach at least a billion dollars in valuation. They don't want to invest in, in small companies. And they also understand that you're going to start small, but ultimately you can grow to be a very large you know, company. So going back to my example of Limoca, if I was painting a picture of a billion uh, English language learners, and each one of them is paying $100, you're talking about a $100 billion you know, business. So you need to be able to do simple math to explain to investors how large your opportunity is. I often tell people, don't worry about five-year projections because nobody believes them. What you really want to do is simple math to explain to them, hey, there's a billion users. Let's say they pay us $100. That's a $100 billion opportunity. Maybe I'm off by a factor of two or whatever, but still it's a 50 to $200 billion opportunity. And if you can get 10% market share, that's a very large company. And they have seen how companies like Facebook and Google have grown tremendously from very small you know, companies at very rapid uh, growth rates. So it is possible to get to billions of dollars of revenue in a you know, five to seven year you know, timeframe. Uh, that has been done before, has been proven as long as the opportunity is very large. So I love the point about simple math, but I will also push back a little, or, or maybe there's a balance, right? There is also the kind of little bit of the bottom up sizing, right? As is the top down. But I completely agree with you that for TAM, you can give any kind of macro fancy pictures, but until the simple math works, it's very yeah. difficult to sort of connect with it. But then when you have to think about where will you get to in the next two, three years, I would encourage people to think about bottoms up kind of approach in mm -hmm. terms of your, you know, addressable market and GTM and so forth. So great. Let's switch gears, uh, you know, a little bit into uh, from fundraising into managing your board and running your company effectively. Any thoughts you have in terms of uh, there was one interesting note in, in the book about running your first board meeting as opposed to every mm -hmm. other board meeting and so forth. So maybe if you want to talk a little bit about some best practices for right. running your company. Well, the, the first thing I would actually say is that find investors, find board members who have either deep startup experience or deep operational experience. That's not to say that we haven't seen very successful VCs who come from a finance background. And there are many of them, of course, but like yourself, Amit, you know, you've had deep operational uh, and startup experience. Uh, and that goes a long ways towards providing really great advice to you know, you know, founders who are doing it for the first time. So that's goal number one, is to build a really great board that can give you strategic advice. Then the first thing I emphasize in my book is that for the first board meeting, you have to kind of level set. You have to make sure that one, you explain to them what your strategy is and you know, how you're going to go acquire customers. And then you need to establish a budget. You have to get agreement on those two main things uh, before you can proceed to the next set of board meetings. And then after that, what I recommend is you create a standard template. Sequoia Capital has a good template that you can go to their website and access their template. And then I would prepare that and actually send that a week in advance to the board. I know that's challenging because most people are trying to, you know, desperately get the board deck done, you know, a day before the board meeting. 
But really what you want to do is to get through the operational information as quickly as possible. And you might even want to give them a call, your board members a call before the board meeting to talk about how things are going operationally and especially make sure that there are no surprises. So if something bad is going on or whatever, you want to tell them before the board meeting. The board meeting should not be a place where they find bad information uh, from you. And then make sure that you set aside enough time in a board meeting to really discuss one or two key strategic issues where you really want feedback from the board. And because you prepared them in advance, you will have a much more productive discussion and you'll get valuable feedback from your board members. Yeah, absolutely agree with the last two points. One is that bad news should take the escalator, right? And good news can you know, climb up the stairs because mm-hmm. you, you don't want to surprise people and, and if anything, over-communicate for sure. And then the other thing is, I don't think people leverage the board meetings enough for strategic discussions. It ends up being a lot more of a business update kind of a meeting, right? Because you're not running an operating review here. You're really yeah. saying what are the trade-offs and the challenges and the opportunities you want to work through. And in fact, equally importantly, how can the board help, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and are you leveraging your board enough, not just for discussion, but to, like you said earlier, make connections with potential acquirers or partnerships or a key hire or whatever it is that, that you're uh, dependent on. So. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. You should generally have one or two asks off the board for every board meeting so that you can leverage their time and connections and so forth. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, uh, Shrish, as we come to the end, sort of switching gears a little bit uh, onto some of your recent, the work that you're doing in Seattle. I know you're very active with the tie, perhaps even headed it. There's a lot of startup ecosystem that's booming. So, it's interesting to see the evolution of Seattle as well, in some sense from the giants like Microsoft and, and Boeing of your to even Amazon and so forth to a quite a thriving sys- ecosystem of new startups. So can you talk a little bit about what is the kind of on the ground buzz in Seattle? What are you seeing in Thai and other organizations that you volunteer with? Any new trends, any new thoughts there? Well, certainly a lot has changed in the last, you know, 25, 30 years. You now have not just Microsoft, but also Amazon have huge presence, of course. And then you have Facebook and Google and others who have large campuses. So the amount of tech talent has increased uh, dramatically. And in any of these companies, you will have some number of people who are tired of that work environment and the bureaucracy and so forth, and they want to join startups. So there is a lot of interest in startups. You've had a lot of success stories as well, which is very important to inspiring young entrepreneurs. So you've had many companies go IPO. You've had companies that have become unicorns. You've had acquisitions like Ally and Supplari and so forth that have done uh, really well. So those are all, all inspiring things for startup you know, founders and for the ecosystem. And with Thai, we've been very active in helping the community. I run a number of programs here from everything from an incubation workshop called Go Vertical to a Thai Institute to train aspiring founders. We also have a small fund to invest in B2B startups. So I would say that Thai Seattle has now become the organization here in Seattle that is the most active in helping founders and entrepreneurs. One quick follow-up question. Oftentimes, there are a lot of Indian SaaS entrepreneurs who sort of start in India, grow, get to a certain scale, and then one of the co-founders will relocate to the US. And whether you like it or not, and I, I spent many years in the Bay Area, often the choice of place is Utah. How would, you, how would you think about somebody who wants to relocate to US from India running a SaaS company to Seattle, perhaps? What would be some of the things that they should look for? Because uh, I'm sure cost of living is perhaps higher than like a Utah or some other places like Austin, maybe. Yeah, certainly uh, Seattle has many uh, advantages, but it's, it has become a uh, lot more expensive in the last you know, 10 years, especially. It is still a lot less expensive compared to the Bay Area. But, you know, people love uh, the Pacific Northwest. Uh, They love the environment and the schools and so forth. So that's very attractive. And the talent, there's a lot of tech talent here, obviously. It is getting expensive, but uh, at the same time, you know, there are a lot of startups who are raising a lot of money so they can afford to pay the higher salaries needed to compete with the likes of Microsoft and Facebook and Google. So there are still many advantages, but things are changing with remote work. You now have the ability to, you know, you may be located in Seattle, 
where a lot of talent lies, but you, you, you now have the ability to recruit people from Utah or Austin and other places and work as effectively as before. Wonderful, Shirish. Uh, one last question as we wrap up. What did you learn about yourself in the process of writing your book? Because uh, writing a book is quite arduous. Uh, I don't know if it's as hard as starting a company uh, or exiting a company, but any thoughts on that? Yeah, actually, it was a really good project. I, I did this during uh, COVID times when I was isolated. So I got a chance to um, uh, talk to a number of entrepreneurs, as you may have noticed in the book, there, there are a number of uh, inspiring startup stories. And so I had the opportunity to talk to a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of VCs and get some really good insights. So overall, it was a much more enjoyable experience than I thought. Uh, it wasn't as arduous as I thought it would be uh, and was a lot more uh, enjoyable at the end. Well, thank you so much, Shirish, for being on the Prime Venture Partners podcast. Uh, it was great to have you. Thank you very much. Great to be in the conversation with you and look forward to the podcast. Dear listeners, thank you for listening to this episode of the podcast. Subscribe now on your favorite podcast app for free and you'll be the first one to know when new episodes are available. Just search for Prime Venture Partners Podcast in Apple Podcast, Spotify, CastBox or however you get your podcasts. Then hit subscribe. And if you have enjoyed the show, we would be really grateful if you leave us a review on Apple Podcast. To read the full transcript, find the link in the show notes.